In the age before concrete and concrete block, hard-working sailors out of Port Credit supplied stone to build foundations in Toronto, Mississauga, and beyond. Dundas shale, the stone, was harvested from the murky bottom of Lake Ontario and was the lifeblood for generations of Port Credit sailors and their families. The shale provided building stone and the shallow waters of the shoreline of Lake Ontario provided the bounty. But the price was high. The work was backbreaking, the risk to life, limb and vessel were ever present and the reward was small. But for many it was the only work to be had to put food on the table. The era of stone hooking began in the 1840s and dwindled by the 1920s. The stone hooker was a small vessel, usually between 20 to 100 tons in burden. Rigged with shallow draft, the typical stone hooker could sail fast in light winds. Many stone hooking vessels were built at the shipyards at Port Credit, and many more called Port Credit Home. Men stood strong and coated their taking. The boats were filled with old Danda shale. Danda shale. Beloved local marine historian, the late Lauren Joyce, fondly related stories of the stonehookers of yesteryear. It was unique. As far as we know, it existed nowhere else in the Great Lakes, but in western Lake Ontario. It was roughly from Port Nelson on the west down to Port Whitby. Now, about half the vessels were Port Credit owned. And I would say for about 50, 60 years, there would be upwards of 20 to 40 vessels would lay in here on a weekend. The harvesting, loading, and moving of the Dundas shale was the hardest part. The stonehooker would anchor close to the shore, usually in anywhere from 6 to 12 feet of water, and the sailors would pry the slabs of shale from the lake bottom either by hand or by using long rakes called hooks or sometimes shovels. The shale would be loaded into a small skiff, yawl boat, or a scow. The small skiffs or yawl boats were often equipped with hoists and A-frames to assist in lifting the stone. The loaded skiff would then be pulled or rowed to the waiting schooner where the shale would be loaded onto the deck and down into the hold. The early vessels had considerable dead rise. In other words, the hull was very high-sided. It was, they were very deep in the bottom and in a keel. Then as those trades, early trades eased off and they went into larger vessels for the trades, then they swung over to stonework. But the trouble is when you had to put the stone up over the rail, which is maybe six, the rail might be five, six feet off the surface of the water. Then when you put the stone down below, they were six, seven feet deep in the hole. So you had to trim the stone fore and aft and on these uh, sloping ceilings of the sides. In the end, they ended up with vessels that were very shallow and very beamy. A lot of them were the scow schooners. Flat bottom, only four and a half foot deep in the hole, four, four and a half feet. They had very heavy deck beams and low sided. So half the stone coming aboard was left on the upper deck. Stone hooking was often a family affair. Many families who called Port Credit home over generations were tied to the rhythm of a sailor's life. Men stood strong and coated their taking. The boats were filled with old Danda shale. One stone hooker was known as the Catherine Hayes. Affectionately called the Kate, the Catherine Hayes had been built in 1833 and was sailed by Thomas Blower of Port Credit. Thomas passed away suddenly in 1867 leaving his wife Emily to raise eight young children, all under the age of 16. In an age without welfare, Emily moved her family onto the Kate and took up her husband's calling, harvesting shale from the bottom of Lake Ontario. Longtime Port Credit resident and Lake Captain Al Hare recollected seeing Emily wading into the water with her skirts billowing around her and hoisting shale from the bottom of Lake Ontario. The shale was hoisted up onto the scow, and from the scow to the deck of the Kate, and from the deck down into the hold, where it would then be sailed to Toronto and sold as building material. 
the family would make about $15 a week. Emily followed this trade, backbreaking as it was, caring for her family. When her eldest son, Mark, took over the family ship and continued stonehooking out of Port Credit until 1915. The success of stonehookers and the harvesting of the shale brought about their own demise. Stonehookers such as the Lillian and the Newsboy could carry 30 tons of shale. The stone was piled into rectangles three feet high, six feet wide, and 12 feet long, called a toys. A toys would bring a stonehooking crew between $3 and $5. Three trips a week and two toys per trip were considered a good output for an average two-man crew. Much of the shell was taken to Toronto, where it was offloaded at Queen's Wharf, at the foot of Bathurst Street. The stonehooking trade declined as shale deposits were depleted in shallow waters. The last of the stonehookers was sold in 1929. Many vessels that sailed out of Port Credit were lost on Lake Ontario, along with the sailors who sailed them. Many early residents of Port Credit were stonehookers and fishermen by trade, and the dangers of the lake were part of daily life. There were many stories told of sailors who never returned home, their resting place somewhere under the deep, cold waters of Lake Ontario. The Schooner Days article series in the Toronto Telegram by C. H. J. Snyder, along with several articles and book excerpts by the late Port Credit historian Lauren Joyce, recall the heyday of the stonehooking trade and the fishing industry on Lake Ontario. It was a hard job and uh, they sure didn't make a fortune. In those days, there was a minimum amount of jobs you could turn to. Anything that, that uh, would give you a living, why you look forward to. The harbor was dark and the crews were a gathering. Morning begins, the sun would hail. Young and old worked, there was no lamenting. They hunted their quarry for old Dunda Shale. Dunda Shale, Dunda Shale. Toronto needed old Dunda Shale. With ships and stone hooks, the boys began.